Alrighty, so I'm back and here is the message that I was trying to get to you guys. That we are in the middle of summer and that can mean that your change of scenery might be something like what I'm coming to you live at, which is in the wild. And it can be difficult to do keto in the wild. For the next six weeks, I'm going to have a series of keto in the wild, which will Well, it will kind of exploit some of these temptations that happen when we are doing something difficult and then a season comes along that, well, it's travel time. It's a change of scenery. There's more social time. You'll go to pool parties. There's lots of sugary drinks out there. And that can be really hard when you're trying to focus on your health and lose weight. Uh, the weight loss is one thing, but that focus on the health well, I've been helping folks with that for a couple of decades, and there are some themes that are definitely found within the, uh, those that succeed, those that do the long game. Because when this difficult season happens, I mean, for heaven's sakes, there's skin showing. <laughs> we all have this fear of that throughout the year, like, okay, 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 am I ready for this? Am I ready for this? Am I even gonna join into this? And the truth is, is when the season comes, if you're like, most patients and most people, you didn't quite hit the goal and they can really continue to double down during a time when that's probably not the best strategy. So we are going to be doing this series called Keto in the Wild while I try to help with some realistic goals of having uh, a, a time of maintaining if your weight at the beginning of June is the same at the beginning of August, that is a celebration. That is an, an, something to be worthy of reaching for and to join in and hear how do others who get through these seasons. I mean, this season here is summer, but a very similar season is the holidays. And it's not an accident that on the Dr. Boz channel, we have two high seasons for our, for our brand. And that is the 21 day that happens after summer and the 21 day course that happens after uh, the holidays. Because it should be a season where you do enjoy, but you're able to maintain. And those folks that have played this long game, I mean, this six weeks is a short game, but those that are able to play the long game, the ones who change behaviors and stay changed for, the, for, a li for a lifetime. Well, there's some rules. And that's what we're gonna go through in these next six weeks while I try to come to you live on location, uh, which I still think I could have made it to the Bay, <laughs> which is not that far away. Um, yeah, that, that long game is, uh, is because when you're looking at these, these six, I call them anchors. They are these rules or mantras that are, they're, they're cycle breakers. They're people who've had a cycle of either repeated weight gain or repeated failure, and they were able to break them. And they do it with, several, with six really important rules, really important anchors that aren't just a little bit of, a, of an identity, they really are. Um, using these to hold on to their identity and their foundation. We're going to go through one of them tonight and we'll do the other five as the next weeks come on. I am going to um, start by checking my numbers because I've had a really good fast. My husband is out of town with a um, thing too. <laughs> I had a meeting with um, Keto Mojo and uh, the leaders of Keto Mojo do not have children. And so I was trying to talk about my kids and it didn't connect. And they, I said, you know, I have thing one, thing two, and thing three. <laughs> and they're like, oh, now we get it. <laughs> so husband is with thing two, <laughs> son number two, who is in Chicago. And he left after a uh, pole vault uh, session this weekend for thing three. <laughs> Uh, and we, he, he is um, not, I keep drifting away. I don't have an anchor. <laughs> He's not here. So my fast started really early on Sunday. And some 
Sundays I usually do well as long as he doesn't offer me a temptation. And without him around, I did great. It was Monday night that I was like, I need to go to bed really early because if I don't, I'm going to eat. So last night was really hard. And I think I've said uh, uh, to a few of you that I went on this keto cruise and, oh, it was awesome. I loved it. But I definitely, uh, I mean, there were lots of keto foods I could have eaten. And I wasn't terrible, but I wasn't perfect. And, boy, I've had a heck of a time getting back on track since then. So here's my numbers counting down. I, yeah, and my... I don't know how to turn this one off yet, so there's got to be a way to turn off that sound. And glucose is 74. If somebody wants to help me with those, um, those numbers, that would be very much appreciated. But the fast I knew was going to be good because I could, I could feel it. Um, I am going to be able to take your numbers here. <laughs> I'm totally far getting away from the... Um, I, have a, I do have some announcements, though, that I think are worth uh, reviewing with all of you. And uh, the first one is, I want to say thank you to those people who submitted a video. We're doing um, a, a series on what I eat in a day. And I made this announcement on the 4th of July that if you've submitted a video in these next few days, um, which was in the email, um, we, would, we would use some of the submissions. And we got some really great stories and um, folks that... Um, well, they eat much more interesting things in a day than I do. Because I said, this video is going to be super boring when you see what I eat in a day. And so to spice it up, we're using, well, we're using you. So thank you for all of you that submitted a video. I suppose if you haven't submitted it yet, uh, we aren't probably going to get to that task for a few more days. But we do have a pretty good selection ahead of us. Uh, the second thing I wanted to announce is that on, uh, um, because I can't show you on my screen, if you go to bozmd.com, and you go to the drop down that's called Dr. Boz Favorites. Uh, you'll see that Keto Summit is August 3rd through the 6th. And if you're looking for the link for that um, activity, it's in Orlando. The interns for the summer will be there and they've got a little activity that they're planning for just engagement and showing, us, showing you about our brand and how we do things. I have a question and answer that I am, am doing at that event. Um, which if it's anything like what the support group was like this morning, it's awesome. Um, we just had some really great check-ins this morning at, at my keto support group here in Orlando. Um, but uh, Keto Summit uh, in Orlando is my, uh, I, said, I said Orlando, I live in Tampa. <laughs> my support group is in Tampa. <laughs> keto Summit is in Orlando and if you're around and can come, great. There's also a link uh, for $45. I think you can get access uh, online or virtually. And again, I do that because I really try to support people that are doing different things in this keto community. And if you're looking for community, those relationships, this event uh, in Orlando is one of my favorites for just finding your tribe and really having fun. Uh, there's a little education, uh, but it really is in the spirit of um, just in, uh, improving your relationships in other people doing the keto journey. Um, October 6th through the 8th, I will be in um, Louisville, my first time ever going there. I submitted my uh, outline and my, um, my stuff this past weekend. So I will be there. Um, I think the event is really mostly on Saturday. But uh, if you click on uh, the Dr. Boz favorites, you'll find the link. Uh, it's officially, I think, the 6th through the 8th. Uh, but the, the heavy day for speakers and the, uh, is on the 7th, which is, I think, Saturday. So if you're looking for an event to go to in October, uh, that's where I'll be. Let's see. The last thing is, um, oh, yes. I did a terrible job of this last week. Uh, I... And I think even the week before, all right, we have a job opening that we are looking for on Dr. Boz's channel. And that job opening is to find a video editor. Um, if you go to bozmd.com and you click on careers, you will see the job description for the video editor. It is, um, it is uh, described there for you. Uh, and uh, I'll give you some hints that uh, we do want somebody who's experienced and um, all of my hires that come through, uh, they, they start with a personality test. So uh, we've had some really great talents apply. And 
boy, getting the right personality for what is already on our team is turning out to be quite a puzzle. So if you are good at this and you're looking for a little extra contracted work, uh, we are looking for some talent. And then don't be shocked when you get a, a, a personality test to say, do you fit on my team? All right, so let's return uh, away from announcements and get to the place where I'm going to go through anchor number one. A statement that I think is so um, apropos for patients over the last 20 years that have struggled with their, um, with their recovery, okay? So in, in my clinic, that would be recovering from high blood pressure, recovering from chemotherapy, recovering from addiction, recovering from a brain injury. And in many of those patients, these medical problems left them with, yeah, with, with a very high sense of urgency at the beginning. And not everybody stayed the course. But the people who did really had that statement of, uh, when we get tired, we rest, but we don't quit. And you know, I can think of so many examples throughout um, you know, the keto journey, uh, and I'll, I'll circle back to that with some of my examples of what I do, but it really is a powerful statement um, in the patients who are trying to get better from you know, from things in life that aren't fair, uh, when, you know, they've put on weight and lost a thyroid and uh, had a surgery and it didn't go right, and now they're in a slow, long game to get better. And if they don't, the problems come right back. So that urgency is really easy to get them to change a behavior at the beginning. But um, it's like any any change, I mean, this, any patient, any change behavior, they'll do well for a while and then they will relax. Uh, and when they relax, if they relax all the way off the wagon, oh, they're the ones that, well, I've buried them. They didn't make it. They, they weren't able to stay the course. Um, even if they had, they might still be buried. Uh, but some of them went back to drinking some of them um, could not maintain uh, the lifestyle that, that was mandatory for their improved behavior. Um, and I think of it in my life as giving, giving myself grace. Um, and it's, you know, I've been around this, the sun, you know, over 50 times now. And I didn't do this as well in my younger years, but I'd like to think I've gotten better, that I give grace to other people pretty generously. It was myself that I had a difficult time giving grace to. Holding standards higher for myself than, well, than is reasonable. And I learned from patients. I learned that when they, the people who got out the other side, who, who I mean, they were 60 years old and they changed a behavior for good. How did they do that? Well. They did it because when they needed to, let, to lighten the pressure, well, they didn't quit. They just rested. So the first anchor is when we get tired, we rest, but we don't quit. So let me loop that back to a, our keto journey. In our keto journey, um, personally, uh, if you've been watching me long enough, you know that I've had seasons of good and bad and good and bad and good and bad and good and bad. And maybe they're not that, you know, that, that black and white, but it's on this spectrum of, oh, I did a little better, then I didn't do so good, then I did a little better, then I didn't do so good. But what I've really, find, really come to find is that, um, well, let's just take my year. Uh, my year is divided into these two peak performances of the 21 days, where this is a live course every day for three weeks, Monday through Friday. And it's intense. It's intense for my team. It's intense for me. It's intense for the coaches. And the students have sometimes never seen an example like this. So I know that before those seasons hit me, uh, a time of just lighten the intensity. But if I fall all the way off the wagon, I don't know if I could lead the 21-day course. <laughs> Again, it's intense. Uh, 
I have to be in a season that's not terrible. I mean, not, not what I was before I did keto, but definitely um, relaxed. Um, not so much pressure on myself. So I think of this summer of seasons, um, I mean, since I've been back from the keto cruise, uh, well, I did lose five of the 10 pounds that got put on during the cruise, but I did not lose all 10. <laughs> and I, I look at um, that fluctuation and say, well, when, when I got back from the cruise, I, you know, I, I had just not gone completely off the wagon. I, I had desserts, <laughs> I had some alcohol, but not that much, but I was completely off my routine. Like, I think by day six of the cruise, I had to go for a run, which I don't really like running, but I'm like, I gotta do something to feel better. I just feel yucky because I'm so off of my routine. Uh, part of it was eating at different times. Part of it was um, you would have travel days and not travel days and then lectures and not lectures. And it was just different routine and it resulted in 10 pounds. So I, I wasn't feeling good while I was putting on those 10 pounds. So my improvement of how do I get better is that I'll slide back to keto continuum number five. And today we had a, a, a gal in, the, um, in our support group who's a type two diabetic. And she comes in with all the fanfare and, and joy and excitement that she had hopped on the keto bandwagon, her blood sugars dropped so much that she was able to stop her insulin. And her ketones were like three or four. <laughs> and of course, everybody who's been around the table a while has, is looking at her like, yeah, 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 just wait, just wait what's happening. And so now she's, uh, you know, several weeks in uh, to that and was really trying to advance too quickly. And we said, no, 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 hold on. I think you need to be at keto continuum number five, which still means that there's cream in her coffee, uh, that she has uh, an eight hour window where she can consume food and it should be in two, two boluses or two inputs of food. She should not be snacking all day. I don't use the word meals because I've been patient, patients say, well, that wasn't my meal. My, I had that snack in the afternoon and I had this later on. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You get two times where you input food. That's it. No more. So whether you call it a snack or whether you call it a, um, a meal, I don't care. There are two boluses of food that go in the gullet and down into your body. And then you can have your cream and your coffee. And I need you to be stable at that for a couple of weeks. And when I fall off the wagon, or at least I'm trying to be in a season that's not as intense, I frequently fall back to that. that there's not nearly as much cream in my coffee as I, um, as there used to be. Uh, the first time I did keto continue number five, I hung out there a long time, like probably nine months, and I thought that there's no way I'm ever giving up cream in my coffee. But I since have, and I, 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 I'm okay to leave it, take it or leave it. It's not nearly that intensity. Um, but when I do add it back, it's also not nearly as much as I was uh, putting in my coffee then. Uh, and the food that I consume in those two boluses of food is not as much. But the other part uh, that happens in, when I relax the rules for myself is instead of a two to three hour window, um, uh, especially the afternoon is a window. I'll many times have a sardine or carnivore crisps uh, at the beginning of the window and then try to have food with my family later on uh, right near that five o'clock, six o'clock hour. Um, it's, not, um, it's, it's not perfect, but uh, when I have relaxed, it's usually a three to four hour window instead of a two to three hour window. Um, and many times I can give up the earlier bolus of food during in the morning. So as I look at what, what relaxing to a, a um, keto continuum number five looks like. I'll probably, I add a splash of cream back to my coffee most mornings. Uh, I have been doing that since the cruise, knowing that white knuckling back to what I was is how you fall, it's how I crash. 
I'll, I'll want to do exactly what I did before. I want to go back to that, um, that same lineup of, um, you know, what is, you know, what does it look like to be, um, you know, what was working when I left. And it's usually something that is too hard to jump right back on the wagon. And that's how I fall off. And again, I've seen this again and again with people fighting health problems, fighting the kind of problems that they should have uh, all, the, all of the motivation. If they could see the next chapter, if they don't stick with it, nobody would give up. But they often can't see the next chapter. Uh, so for the next six weeks, I will probably be in keto continuum number five. It's a much more strict version than what I did the first time. Uh, my eating window won't be three or four, two or three hours. It'll be three or four. Um, I may continue to have uh, eggs in the morning. Sometimes that bolus will be even wider than the two to three hours. So I'll have something in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, so then my eating window is um, not just cream in my coffee, but cream in my coffee with eggs and then the afternoon. Um, and, you know, when I'm being really good, uh, like during the 21 day, I will stop eating in the afternoon. I won't have supper. Uh, but I often say, nope, I, I go back to eating with the family and making sure that's really part of my schedule. Um, so one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah. That, that what you're, so the reason that I go back to that is I know I can find my rhythm when I do that. I choose Keto Continuum number five because that was a very solid rhythm for me. And the memory of how I did it, oh, it's super easy. It's super easy for me to, uh, to, to not only do it that way, but also to be um, a, uh, to find success and be, you know, confident and proud of what I'm doing. I'm gonna see if I can toggle over here under the other <laughs> side. Um, so let me say that anchor one more time that the, the, the folks who get through uh, the long game, not the short game, which is six weeks of summer, but the long game. They change a the behavior and the behavior sticks. That means they are described, or I would describe them as when they get tired, they rest, but they don't quit. And we're going to have five more of these uh, over the next uh, six weeks for you to learn from and hopefully give feedback to. I'm going to put my little pricker up there on the dock. Uh, um, but we're going to now see if we can take some questions. I will tell you at the end of this, I'm going to go back on my bike because I think uh, I did this the other day and it did not crash. And it makes me angry that it's crashed uh, on my way out because I want to show you the bay. There were manatees up there last time. All right, so I'm going to uh, scroll and see if we can find some. Actually, I think somebody on my team will pin a uh, question. So I think it's Leslie uh, 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 writes this saying, when my blood glucose and insulin are down, my body decides to make glucose and it overcompensates rather than making enough for a respectable blood sugar of 60 to 80, it overshoots and gets my blood sugars into the 90s. Okay, so what I would want to know about um, your question there, Leslie, uh, is when you're looking at um, a blood sugar, so you're aiming for this blood sugar of 65 to 80, which would be awesome. That would be perfect in my book. Um, when you're saying your body makes glucose, um, let me tell you the rules of gluconeogenesis. Gluc and you'll know you're in gluconeogenesis because you're at 65 blood, blood glucose. 65 blood glucose, maybe 70. Gluconeogenesis doesn't happen at 90. What's happening at 90 is you are emptying storage. Um, you, you could test this um, with, a, with a fast. Now, if you've read my book or you've looked into things, you'll know that I don't tell people to fast until they're keto adapted. Uh, it's usually nowhere, anywhere close to the first two months of doing keto that I want them in a very stable, solid rhythm of um, 
doing keto before they ever fast. And I don't use the F word, anything short of 36 hours. Fasting is 36 hours or longer. But what's really amazing to me is when we do the sardine challenge and when we do a 72 hour fast as a group and I have everybody hooked up to continuous, or uh, some are on continuous glucose monitors, but many are on, um, uh, they are just on the Keto Mojo dashboard so I can see everybody's morning fasting glucose. And when they're insulin resistant on the first and second days, their glucose stays high. It stays high in that 90 range. And so when you say my body's making glucose, it is not making glucose. It is emptying the glycogen. It's emptying the storage. And if we could open up your belly and look into your abdomen, your liver, when you're making that high of glucose without eating, it's filled with excess sugar. Uh, you usually will not find that glucose going into the gluconeogenesis, which is the, um, the blood sugars of 65, 70, and the ketones are like one and a half or two at that point until they get to that 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72 hour fast. So it's in that high 60s and low 70s hours fasted. I mean, salt and water only or black coffee. Uh, but they have to get to that point before they can really see that chemistry shift. And that's when they've emptied the glute, their liver. Um, when your blood sugar is still at 90, I'm telling you by definition, your liver is not empty. It's still emptying. That, you, you can't make sugar that high in gluconeogenesis. It doesn't work that way. Um, you know, the other, the other really <laughs> sad but um, painful truth is that you don't, um, your liver fills right back up again when you eat. When people say, oh, I emptied my liver, they think that you only have to do it once. No, you filled it a thousand, a hundred thousand times over the last 30 years. And to get your liver back to normal, you need to empty it. Well, not really a hundred thousand times. It does repair faster than you broke it, but it's a lot. There are, many times where you have to empty your liver, go with those repeated fasts to really downsize this, the size of your liver. It's a really common question, good question. All right, uh, Dawkins was here, TCG is the next question. And it says, how do you stay in ketosis on the sardine fast when the protein in them is higher than the fat? Well, I would push you to try uh, what happens when you eat sardines for three days. Uh, if you've seen some of my videos on um, excess protein, I'll tell you that uh, yes, you can eat too much protein. And there are plenty of carnivores out there that will show you eating too much protein um, has a problem uh, with staying in ketosis. But I never find that on the sardine challenge. Um, the, the sardine challenge is a, I mean, there's, there's no better way to induce satiety than eating sardines. Yes, the, the flavor gives you a little, it's actually not the flavor so much as the smell, where they're, when you, they eat only sardines, um, and then the can is your portion size. So it's really hard to get people to snack on sardines they usually eat them and then they stop. Unlike when people overeat pro protein on a carnivore diet, uh, they find uh, many ways to snack. Now it's carnivore, it's, it's protein, but it's the multiple boluses of food going in. Every time you do that, when you're insulin resistant, you produce insulin. And then your body will take that protein and it will act more like um, a carbohydrate than it will a protein. Uh, it'll, it, in, you produce the, the insulin in that fat, in that uh, whenever you swallow food. Uh, I've been wearing a continuous glucose monitor uh, and my sugars are pretty good. In fact, it can be a little, when you're in the season I'm in, it can almost be like too reassuring. Like, oh, I can eat a little bit of that. I can eat a little bit of that. It didn't raise my blood sugar too much. Uh, 
but what reminds me that I am still, I'm still paying the price of those years of excess insulin is that when I eat, well, I love black licorice. Um, so I don't eat the whole bag of black licorice, but I do have a, you know, a, a, a black licorice from time to time. And if I eat the black licorice, when I had the continuous glucose monitor, the sugars didn't go so high when I ate it, but they plummeted about 30 minutes later. Why do they do that? Because even though I've been keto since 2015, I still over overproduce the insulin because of the years that I did that when I was eating high carb. So, um, so technically, that's still an excess production of insulin, which is what insulin resistance is. Uh, I'm way healthier than I was, but I also know that, yeah, my body still makes too much insulin when I eat carbs. So the, um, the best way to, so when you look at that protein production, that protein consumption, excuse me, uh, in the sardine challenge, yes, there's protein, but it's put in, in specific boluses and the content of protein and fat in each one of those cans of sardine, well, they don't overeat on the sardine challenge and, um, and they don't overproduce insulin because they're only eating you know, three cans a day or two cans a day, or if, even if they have two cans in one setting, um, the insulin produced by that bolus of food is limited to that one time. So yeah, it's satiety that's really being flexed when you look at um, why that is with the sardine challenge versus the... All right, John Ford, one of my favorite folks. Uh, John Ford has some of the best stories and has shared them, and I've, I've used his stories to teach other people. So. Nice to see you, John Ford. Uh, does a sardine challenge lower ApoB? How else, what else lowers ApoB? So ApoB, I got the greatest gift this week, actually. I got a, so Dave Feldman, as you know, uh, is, you might not know, he's a citizen scientist, and he's done some really great things at trying to analyze how do people, how, what, what's the health of people on a ketogenic diet and um, lean mass hyper responders is, I think, his term maybe. <laughs> but he also is in charge of, or the reason you all have access to own my own labs. And uh, just hats off to his leadership. And he was on the keto cruise too. And so we did some bonding and shared some. He gave a lecture on April B, and I gave a lecture on April B. And uh, he sent me the best gift. I wish I had it in front of me. It, it, it's crocheted by his mother in the shape of an, uh, a lipoprotein. <laughs> and it's got the, it's anatomically correct. I made him a video and said, I think I learned, I, I, if I would use this crocheted ball <laughs> to teach lipoproteins, uh, it's more than I ever learned in medical school about a lipoprotein. <laughs> anyway, so how do you lower ApoB is what the question is. And the answer is, um, it is it is not the first metrics that I have people focus on. In order to successfully lower ApoB, first, they have to lower the average blood sugar. So before you start looking at ApoB, be sure your average blood sugar is, your hemoglobin A1C is around 5, 5.1, 5.2 is great. Should for sure be less than 5.5. Uh, the second thing I have people focus on is make sure your C-reactive protein, your, your inflammatory marker is low. And that is, again, if you've had years of insulin resistance and you're focused on ApoB, you've got them in the wrong order. You cannot fix everything at once. You have to start with sugars, inflammation. The other marker of inflammation that is, um, is really important to get as low as you can get is uric acid. It is difficult to change that, but your uric acid and your hemoglobin A1C should be the same number. They should both be five, <laughs> around five is what I would encourage you to do. So if those are okay, then I have people start focusing on ApoB. Um, the Apo, because if you try to reduce ApoB when those other metrics are not normalized, you're just measuring noise. There is so much volatility in your ApoB from day to day that you're just wasting your time. You have to fix the other things first. Now I know John Ford has. 
And so I'm going to speak to him in that, and, and those of you that, yep, I got my A1C down, yep, I've got a really good uh, uric acid or uh, C-reactive protein, now how do I get this darn ApoB down? Well, number one, you, um, genetics play a part. So your LP little a is a, is a metric in your blood tests that are, uh, that, that is, especially if it's really high, um, that's gene that's a genetic risk factor. So checking that, and if you do have the genetics for that, you and your doctor have to lower that ApoB because the chances you're going to do it without pharmacology is very difficult. If your ApoB is um, elevated, then with all those other things normal, and you don't have an elevated LP little a, um, I push people to get their ApoB under 90. Um, I love it under 50, uh, especially if they've already had a heart attack. But it usually results in very little food. When, I, when people say, what are you eating today? And they're all excited about me to record that. I'm like, well, the truth is I, I can't afford to eat that much or my ApoB goes up. Um, and I don't want to take medicines any more than the rest of you. So I have to limit the amount of food intake I have. Um, while keeping my muscle mass from deteriorating. And then I have to remember that I'm not perfect, that I screw it up a lot. And so when I make a mistake, it can take me, and I don't mean a mistake, when I have a season like the keto cruise, well, sometimes I take a while to get back on that bandwagon. All right, we're gonna do one last question by, when, by Wendy. So the, the, the answer there is yes, medications will improve your ApoB. Uh, don't focus on it till you get those other metrics correct. And finally, um, the um, you'll have to be at keto continuum number seven or eight, meaning a short and narrow eating window. Like that's what I do is try to keep it to a two to three uh, hour eating window uh, when I'm doing great. During this season, I'm not being that strict. I'm trying to just not gain any weight before August 1st. Um, and I... Uh, and if I, if I was doing everything right, well, then I would have to talk about a medication that could, could lower it. Um, all right, Wendy writes in and says, Dexcom uh, CGM versus Keto Mojo, which is more reliable? I feel like the CGM is going nuts and constantly saying my, GIA, uh, my uh, glucose index is low. Yeah, so my husband has a, I, I think I, if you watch that video, he loves this little gadget that's on his arm, right? but you have to calibrate it within the first, like especially within the first three or four hours of putting it in. One of those uh, CGMs, especially Dexcom, Dexcom 7, if that's what you're referring to, is amazing technology. It is remarkably accurate after you calibrate it in the first six hours of wearing it. So it works for 10 days, right? But those first few hours, like I tell people, don't put this turkey on at bedtime because it's going to yell at you all night long uh, because you haven't calibrated it. The calibration happens, um, uh, I like to check it like four or five times in those first six hours, and then it is super accurate from then on. When I get a super low reading that says, you're gonna die, your blood sugar is 34, which is not true, um, the Keto Mojo is more accurate, but I still would check Keto Mojo twice before to, if you've got something, you know, the multiple checks is what you would get the best of. Mojo is more accurate than the uh, the continuous glucose monitor. That little microfiber, so you put them in on the back of your arm, and that little microfilament hangs out in your uh, the, the little fat layer that's under your skin. So it's not in the blood. It's in the... Um, it's in the, um, the adipose tissue. So when, when you get, um, my kayak was drifting the wrong way. When you get, uh, you know, you say the, t the tie goes to the, to, the, um, to the keto mojo. It always, that's the one that you get to vote for. So I'm gonna do something which may or may not work. I'm gonna spend the next two minutes going to the place where I wanted to show you. Uh, so I'm gonna turn off the Wi-Fi here and uh, let's see here. And I'm going to use my, um, I'm going to use my, this is what I wanted to do. Let's 
see how if I go fast to that low low spot, maybe it'll come right back on. So hang out with me. Uh, I don't, I, oh, there is one more question. Uh, I'm going to read the question while I, it's, I need to keep ketones below 1.5 and my, oh, I'm not going to read that one right now. All right. I'm just going to tell you about my, uh, my favorite place to go. So some of the other things that I do with keto in the wild is I, well, I find other places to get pleasure. And um, we don't have a motorboat. And that's okay with me. Um, they are behavior and staying the course. And I will tell you, it is super cool when he said, well, what do you do? You used to get up in the morning and have peanut butter cookies. Uh, what do you do now? And he replied to the whole group. He's like, well, we've kept the social aspect of breakfast, we, but we just have black coffee. And I was really quick to point out, yep, you have learned to take the pleasure that you used to get from food and you have transferred it to the pleasure of eating with a woman that you're married to for the last, I mean, it might be 50 years they've been married. I don't know, maybe not quite many, many but a lot. And, you know, I said, you're the joy that you get out of not just being uh, healthier, but to stop getting so much pleasure from those peanut butter cookies and to still notice that, well, wasn't the pleasure always coming from, from the woman that you're eating the cookies with? It was just the best check-in. It was such a beautiful moment where he was like, oh yeah, that's what I do. I said, yeah, now eventually, the next step is to have, uh, have activities where there are no, there is no food that you are with the people you love, but it's not focused on the food. And that is a heck of a cultural thing to change. But when I go out on my kayak, there's no food. <laughs> and I love it. All right, so I'm gonna turn the camera around so you can see this beautiful bay. And I, the other night when I was out here testing it, there was a manatee. Let's see if you can see it. There we go. So there is the the bay, it's not quite the bay, it's a, but it's enough of a bay for me to call it. And I'll show you where the manatee is and then I'll turn it around and we'll call it a night. Hold on. All right. So there's, I think that's called the Veterans Expressway. And you can see that I live near the airport because there's an airplane taking off. But the manatees are down this way. So I will quickly paddle over to that section and then I'll be signing off. I knew I should have come out this far. <laughs> it worked perfectly on Sunday when I was testing it. Dang it. All right, so way at the end of that canal, that's where the manatees were. So next time I do this, if I'm ever brave enough to do this again, I'll go down there. All right, well, I would love to hear from you guys. This Keto in the Wild started out with a little bit of rocky start for my live, but I hope you found value in it, and I'd love you to check out the next five weeks as I take on a few more anchors for how patients have done the long game. See you next week, guys.